Now, what I'd like to do in the next um, 10, 15 minutes is try to give a sense of uh, why we've put this session together, why we felt it was a good time to actually have a session like this, uh, tag um, and rethinking the map. And again, I'll start with a quote from Whitmore, maps, where do we begin with something so practical, so pervasive, so mundane? And hopefully during the course of this afternoon, we'll get some ideas about how we might begin, how we might proceed and where we might end up. Um, as you're all painfully aware, in the latter part of the 20th century, maps came under sustained critique and deconstruction in a range of disciplines. Um, avowedly objective scientific representations bound up with the projects of modernity, supposed neutral windows onto the reality of the world. It was, maps were, were quite a bad thing. And we see a host of um, claims or uh, flavourings coming out, tainted with surveillance and voyeurism inherently objectivist, unashamedly Cartesian, non-token indexical statements, specular, detached, and analytical, etc., etc., etc. And I've culled these from various publications from the mid-90s onwards. Irrevocably gendered, tight and militaristic and colonial undertakings, and so on. And an active interest in mapping and cartography, I think, slipped a little from the agenda. How are these critiques themselves have come under scrutiny um, in the early noughties and basically through uh, the last 10 years or so, particularly in the fields of human geography and cartography, where we've seen a critical cartography emerge. And these critiques noted that the prior criticisms of the map were themselves based upon a tacit and fallacious understanding of what actually maps are and what the ontological status of the map was, i.e. the idea that maps are based upon the assumption that the world could be truthfully and objectively represented, yeah, using scientific techniques. Now, if you take that as the underlying ontology of the map, then some of those early critiques have value. But if that isn't the case, then we can maybe start to tease them apart and uh, explore them more critically. And this rethinking of the ontological base basis of cartography um, has led within human geography in particular away from what might be termed a representational cartography to a post-representational one or a more than representational cartography where the focus has been less on the idea or the assumption of the map as spatial truth the map as window onto the world and more towards the idea of maps as process or intimately bound up in process Instead of being interpreted as objects at a distance from the world, regarding that world from nowhere, maps should be understood as being in the world, as open to the disclosure of things. Maps come to life when people start using them in a particular setting for a particular purpose. Maps are not considered finished, but is continually remade every time someone engages with them. Kitchen has argued that mapping involves processes of gathering, working, reworking, assembling, relating, sifting, speculating, and so on. Maps are of the moment brought into being through practices, always remade every time they're engaged with, every time we unfold one and spend some time with it. Mapping is a process of constant re-territorialization. Maps are practices. So a very different kind of underlying sense of what a map is. <clears throat> What's possible, really, with a map? What's the underlying kind of reality of a map? And these critiques, again, emerging within human geography, emerging within cartography, have been echoed within recent archaeological works. Um, Whitmore, for example, a map is a crowded place, a collective achievement, a he an heterogeneous assemblage, a conversation. And uh, I hope if Ben is here, I hope he doesn't mind me culling from his presentation on Monday, but uh, plans find meaning through entanglement. Plans play a role in coding behaviours and making places distinctive. That was something that came out in the first session I attended at uh, TAC this year. And I think this renewed interest in mapping, maps as process, has emerged as part of, um, of the material turn that um, Julian Thomas has recently kind of summarised in that really, really neat, lucid antiquity article, uh, the new materialisms, speculative materialisms, object-oriented philosophies and process theories, the kind of ontological turn and the move towards relationality, symmetry 
and flat ontologies. And this has created, if you like, a space to think more critically about the idea of maps as processes. And we see the work of Webmore on map works, and this idea of maps and gathering, uh, weaving together and mediating the abstraction of the map and subject-centered perception to create something which is more than a map. We've seen a growing interest in deep mapping um, and ideas of chorography, um, which reflects very early antiquarian or choreographic interests in trying to understand and communicate the essence of place through building a deep map comprising history, folklore, natural history, hearsay, rumor, stories, uh, feelings, alongside the more kind of um, quantitative uh, or surveyed mapping exercise. And deep maps, again, encourage us to explore, to delve, to look for juxtapositions, to look for tensions and contradictions, complementarities. We're seeing an interest in the idea of the map as a prosthesis coming through from ideas of cyborg ontologies. And again, the work of Shanks and Webmore has been quite interested in this, the articulation of nature cultures with device and human body engaging in purpose-driven practice. And the idea that something different emerges from that engagement between us and the map. It's all interesting stuff. And I think there's been a new openness to maps and mapping in a more than relational world. And the number of kind of um, simplistic critiques of maps or a move away from map mapping bad um, have kind of died down a little. And we're starting to see some quite interesting experiments in how to convey information um, rather than statements, invitations to engage with what's depicted. And Gavin Lucas has argued that maps have a value as mediating devices for creating aggregate entities, assemblages that exist on spatial and temporal scales otherwise invisible to us. And again, I think there's an, an enormous amount of potential nestling in there in those arguments and suggestions of Lucas. So we've flagged, um, or we'd like to flag, a number of kind of questions, issues, um, themes to underpin the papers you're going to hear this afternoon, things we'd like you to think about as you hear, hear the, uh, the presentations. Where do maps come from? Where do our archaeological maps come from? Is something I think is really quite important. And it's critical to understand that archaeological maps have an orthodox disciplinary history, but that's not their only history. And to give you an example, the distribution, the humble distribution map, and um, I could have counted distribution maps through the course of TAG, but I thought it was a bit cute. But there were quite a few uh, in today's sessions in particular. But if you take the distribution map, it has an orthodox history which runs something about like this. Cholera, German anthropogeographers filtered through Crawford and Fox, and then unleashed them to a world, an archaeological world, which embraced them, loved them, and worked with them. So we see cholera maps, and we see Fox, and we see distribution maps used in publications uh, you know, popping up around us. And again, I simply took that from the most recent book I've, I've been reading. So we've got an orthodox history. We know where distribution maps come from, or we think we know. But there's been some very, very interesting research in their other histories. Are there hidden histories regarding the, the birth and the impact of distribution mapping on archaeology that might subvert or um, challenge our accepted understandings, or maybe co-opt different understandings into our appreciation of what a distribution map is and what you might be able to do with it. And here, Helen Wickstead's research on the social history of Peake and Crawford and the influence of the cult of Kata on Crawford's ideas regarding the place, role and importance of distribution mapping are absolutely fascinating. Uh, and I strongly recommend this stuff to you. But it offers a very different perspective on where distribution maps come from. Yeah? A very different idea on the, the kind of um, themes which inf infuse and inform them. And I must confess, I'll never look at a distribution map in quite the same way again. I guess the key question is, will I ever use one in quite the same way again? 
How do we map? How do we map? Um, I think it's fair to say that how we produce maps in archaeology is shaped by careful rules and strictures, standards, guidelines, and accepted ways of doing. And these are often fiercely political. There are right ways of mapping and there are wrong ways of mapping. Um, and I was horrified to find that there are websites out there which are, which are looking at this. And as a result, you can produce what is deemed a good map. Yeah. And you can see where this is going, yeah? And a bad one. Now, I was horrified. I thought, oh, Christ, that's me. I'm so stuffed because they only need to look at my archive. <laughs> bad, bad, bad. But again, there's that sense of, of there's, there's a right way of doing, yeah? And by implication, a wrong way. Yet these rules and accepted ways of doing have a developmental history. They have a history that's bound up with complex personal networks and agendas. Networks and agendas that need to be unpacked and unpicked. What Bradley has termed craft traditions in British field archaeology, for example, traditions that themselves have a critical history. And I think it's, you know, it'd be potentially very interesting to try to unpack those histories. Yeah. In much the same way that Helen has done with distribution maps. Rather than blindly perpetuating existing practices, is now a good time to fashion a few new ones. And I'm um, thinking of uh, Mari's paper where she was showing the map, mapping the internet, the interweb, and mapping tweets and stuff. There are people out there engaging with precisely these kinds of challenges and questions. I suppose a really important question is what do archaeological maps actually do? Why do we generate them? And here, Cacard, um has raised a really quite pertinent and interesting point. Since our mental spatial models are not map-like, and maps are not world-like, the use of maps as the intermediary between mental spatial models and the world is at best inaccurate and at worst irrelevant. Either way, we need to think about it. And I think they've got a point. As Whitmore has noted, it's remarkable, given the necessity of maps for the work of archaeology, that we've written so little on what they actually do in the context of knowledge production. That's another theme I hope will come through in the papers this afternoon. That one dates from, that's an old Bradford geophysics map from about 1983. Bless its heart. It's good to be back. <laughs> Shulton has recently written that the assumption of the transparency of the map, that it simply renders facts in graphical form, is significant and captures the tenacious assumption that maps should be regarded as scientific rather than argumentative documents. And I put that quote up merely to highlight the argumentative element. And I wonder, I wonder, folks, whether it's time we got a little bit more argumentative with our maps and what we use our maps for. Grr, get in there, <laughs> stir it up a bit. For example, can we use our maps to unsettle and challenge our understandings, disrupt our explorations and engagements, make us think differently about stuff we think we understand? And here we can draw on some of the work of the Situationist International Psychogeography um, to defamiliarize, to make the familiar unfamiliar in order to make us think differently about it. And I use the example, Karen O'Rourke has recently discussed the example of a, two groups of psychogeographers exploring the armpit of Utrecht, a new development around Utrecht, but they were given a map of Rome and told to meet at the Ponte Garibaldi in 45 minutes. Now, in a session earlier, Adrian Chadwick had a map with we are here and an arrow. Yeah. These are maps where you're not here really and you're not there either. Yeah, and they. They managed it, but it changed their understanding of the layout of the armpit of Utrecht. And apologies for anyone here from Utrecht. Um, but again, it's a way of defamiliarizing. And I think to use maps to defamiliarize is a really, really interesting and challenging exercise. For example, we can take the uh, very short-lived experimental psychogeographic markup language which was developed not to tag websites, but to tag places. 
Um, and it provides a different way of tagging the emergent qualities of the gaps and inscriptions on our map sheets. Distinct, open, closed, lively, ease, desolate, hectic, terror, horror, stim, ooh, dross, ugh, et cetera, et cetera. And you're encouraged not to, not to discover these, but for them to discover you as part of your journey, as part of your engagement with the map and the places. And it's an interesting, I thought, woo, you know, that'll be interesting. Okay, my map legend had dross, hectic, stim, instead of the usual stuff tagged on it. I went and had a mooch around Leicester to see whether you could actually apply this, and it's actually quite an interesting exercise, albeit at Leicester today. For example, and as a little nod to the HTML crowd in there, um, lively, close, close, desolate, dross. <laughs> and you can, oh, that is a geeky gag. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> but again, we can start to think about how we annotate, mark up, codify our map sheets. Um, much fun to be had there, I think. How might we use archaeological maps not to represent, but instead to rewire our understandings of space and place? How can we do that? A colleague at Leicester, Matt Beamish, loaded the first edition OS into his GPS and went exploring. Is that time travel? Possibly. He said he never thought about, about things he thought familiar changed dramatically, largely because he kept tripping over things. Um, but again, it's, is that a walk in the present, a walk in the past, or something different? Either way, it's interesting. Why do we always treat or tend to treat maps as end products instead of starting points, uh, statements instead of invitations. I mean, that's not really telling you where fairies, giants, and foggots are, but it's inviting you to explore a host of relational capacities bound up in the stories between people, animals, places, otherworldly entities, times, stories, things, materials, memories, etc. Let's take up the invitation. We can look at deep mapping as an ongoing dialogue and over the last oh, 10 years or so, um, with my final year students, they've been going off making their own annotated maps of the local park, letting me, giving me an insight into what they get up to in the park, which is truly, truly horrifying. Um, <laughs> but I'm slowly building, it's, it's almost like a deep map of feckless behavior. Um, but again, the map on the right is simply a, a kind of a condensation, if you like, of all of those places where they do stuff. Um, as I say, that's going fast for a reason, because some of the things they do are quite, quite, uh, quite terrible. But again, ongoing dialogue, deep maps as dialogues, not as statements or, or representations of this is what it's like. Now, artists have long been alive to such possibilities. Uh, shouldn't we be too? Yeah. I guess that's kind of basic point I'm trying to get across here. Now, I hope that served as a kind of um, brief summary of why we put the session together, and why we think it's important, and why we think now is a good time to do it, as we're starting to see an inventive, a kind of much more inventive approach to how we map and what we map for. Some questions we'd like you to ponder and chew during the course of the afternoon are listed on the slide here. And these are things we hope will help to structure discussion and structure questioning. Why are maps so common yet so under-theorized in archaeology? What's the secret behind their naturalization? What might be achieved through an active rethinking or theorizing of the map? Is it worth it? Is this, is this something worth buying into or not? What may be some of the alternatives to current archaeological practices? What are the implications of digital transition, digital mapping approaches for archaeological cartography? And in what ways are archaeological mapping practices affecting archaeological interpretation. So, without further ado, I'll hand you over to the first of our speakers.